Good morning again, everyone, and welcome back from your early break. Um, thanks, David and Melissa, for chairing that last session um, about ATI's work and, and, uh, and, and where we're going. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's annual conference, Janet McCabe, Deputy Administrator of the United States Protection Agency. Welcome. She and Administrator Michael Regan lead the agency's, as we all know, demanding work to protect public health and the environment for all Americans, and especially in the case of climate change, basically for everyone on the planet. Janet McCabe's official bio, much like she is, is modest and vastly understated for all that she's accomplished. It states, Janet McCabe is Deputy Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to rejoining EPA in April 2021, Deputy Administrator McCabe was a professor of practice at Indiana University and the director of the IU Environmental Resilience Institute. Over the course of her career, McCabe has spent time working at EPA's Air Office State Environmental Agencies in Massachusetts and in Indiana, and at a Children's Environmental Health Ag Advocacy Organization in Indianapolis. That short bio tells part of the story. Spending time at EPA really means spending seven challenging years as the principal deputy and later act acting assistant administrator for the AIR program during the Obama administration, during which time she worked characteristically tirelessly, for anyone who knows her, on major national initiatives, including the Clean Power Plan, PM and Ozone NACs, vehicle greenhouse gas standards, and much more. As a member of the U.S. Clean Air Act Advisory Committee, I had the privilege of seeing her work firsthand, including the breadth of her leadership and perhaps more importantly, the values she brought to that work as a human being. Others on the committee often saw her efforts to reach out to the energy, power, motor vehicle, and other major sectors in her ongoing efforts to craft fair and equitable rules. What also came across, though, throughout her career, indeed, and indeed and throughout her career, was her commitment essentially for the little guy, whether listening to family farmers in Indiana or looking out for kids in her advocacy work. I especially recall her taking great satisfaction giving an, e an annual EPA Clean Air Act Excellence Award, a great EPA tradition, by the way, to a small Native American weekly radio show in Spokane, Washington, the Inner Tribal Beat. It was tiny, but it featured interviews with tribal partners on clean air and best practices. It's just one example of her signaling why what we do is important and the people we do it for matters. Finally, as AA for Air and now Deputy Administrator McCabe, she traveled to Brussels, where with several scientists who are in this room today, she joined an HEI EU WHO delegation to the European um, uh, Parliament to present EPA's NAXT, NAXT process and the latest science on air pollution and health, all in part of helping Europe set in place regulations during its year of air. It's a classic example of bringing quality science to policy. Science questions that we're all making progress on again today and will indeed return to Brussels to do that again next year. All of us at HEI really appreciate your taking time from your remarkably busy schedule to join us here today to talk about EPA's vision under the Biden administration for clean air, climate and energy, and of course, environmental justice. I ask you to join me in welcoming Janet McCabe to the podium. Isn't he nice? He's so nice. Um, it, it, thank you so much for having me today, and you can thank me later for getting an extra uh, early coffee break because I was late. I uh, apologize. That's um, the sentence that I say most these days is, I'm so sorry for being late. Um, I, I'm sure that some of you have that, uh, have that feeling too. So um, I, I do want to thank you um, and, and thank um, the Health Effects Institute for having this conference. Um, isn't it nice to be back in person? Do you, do you have people joining virtually too? Yeah, awesome. Um, that's one good thing that I think we should, we've uh, benefited from during this pandemic that um, will just, for events like this, just make it 
um, broaden your reach so much. And um, I, I learned this at, um, at Indiana University when I was there. We would have people join conferences from all over the world who couldn't possibly have joined before. And so, so that's great. Um, but uh, I know that I'm here to talk about air pollution, climate change, um, and uh, that's what you guys have been all about. I'm really pleased. Um, uh, Honestly, I'm thrilled uh, to, and honored to be here on behalf of EPA and the Biden-Harris administration. Um, I thought I had died and gone to heaven to have one shot at EPA. Um, never expected that I would have a, a second one. Um, so since 1980, HEI, your scientists and your partners have been conducting groundbreaking research on the connection between air pollution and human health. And I'll just, I'll just note that um, all the stuff that Bob went through in my, um, uh, my resume there, that all happened while HEI was doing its work. Um, I graduated from college in 1980. So for my entire adult life, HEI has been producing high quality science, contributing to um, our path towards um, a cleaner and healthier world. Um, and um, that is a lot, I can assure you, that is a long time. Um, I've been doing this a long time and so have you. And your work has, has helped pave the way for some of the most important public health actions we've taken as a nation over those years. Um, and also you have been just a, um, an outstanding um, a, a, an instrumental voice in communicating. Uh, we need all kinds of voices communicating to the public, to um, policymakers, um, uh, to stakeholders. And um, sometimes the uh, disassociated or um, objective, credible sci scientific voice is just the one that you need, um, and, and you guys have done that. Um, and uh, it's through partnerships between EPA and HEI, state governments, tribal governments, um, industry, um, all of our stakeholders that we've been able to make the kind of progress that we've made over the past 50 years. Um, and just to quote a statistic that you guys probably know as well as I do, um, that since the Clean Air Act was enacted now um, uh, in 1970, uh, more than 50 years ago, um, air pollution has dropped by, um, by 80%. I mean, it kind of depends on how you count, but it's around there, right? Um, and the economy has almost tripled. Um, and uh, we, we say that a lot because it's really important for people to hear those numbers um, and, and to understand that um, we have made a lot of progress on clean air and we have not done it at the expense of our quality of life, in fact, um, just the opposite, or our economy. And we all, everybody in this room, everybody at EPA um, has a role to play in continuing that progress. Um, at EPA, our job focuses on implementing the nation's environmental laws, setting standards to protect public health, and, it, and advancing and funding research into critical topics of environmental health, research that will educate the public and develop the science on which our policies and regulations are based. At HEI, your job is, includes continuing to do what you've been doing since 1980, building on the 330 research projects, 20, 260 reports, and more than 1,000 journal articles that have informed air quality decisions that protect American lives. So thanks to your website for delivering up those statistics. It's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just so impressive. So um, I know you will keep um, the, that front and center, keep the research front and center. You will keep the partnership with, with EPA and with um, other important um, federal and state and tribal agencies. Keep doing your job communicating with the public. Um, the more we know, the more everyone knows, the more we can do to protect health, um, especially um, for those who are the most vulnerable um, in society. Um, so I wanna start there. Um, in talking about um, the administration's priorities. When President Biden took office in January of 2021, um, I, I think it's uh, fair to say that he launched the most ambitious environmental agenda in our nation's history. It certainly seems that way to those of us that um, are working in his administration. And EPA, um, uh, with the leadership of Administrator Michael Regan, has been working hard to implement that vision um, which includes uh, restoring scientific integrity to the work that the agency does, protecting clean air, confronting climate change, and advancing environmental justice um, in order to achieve a healthier and more equitable America. Um, so let me start there by talking about um, the last part of that sentence, a more equitable America. 
uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris have called on the whole of government for a whole of government approach to advancing equity and justice across all of our activities in the executive branch to address systemic in inequities that communities, families, and individuals across the country are facing. Um, and we've had some recent reminders, um, quite honestly, of about how much attention we have to pay to the ongoing work to address systemic inequities. They're rooted in generational issues of environmental racism and classism. We can all see how decades and even centuries of disinvestment in certain communities and policies that have barred certain people from opportunity have led to the realities faced today by communities of color, low-income communities, women and children, and indigenous communities. They're overburdened by multiple sources of pollution in their air, in their water, and on the land around them. Their communities are more vulnerable to any level of pollution. They're more heavily impacted by every change in our climate and have less capacity to cope with even the smallest of changes, let alone the catastrophic ones we're seeing with increased regularity. These are generally the same communities that face higher rates of heart and lung disease, whose children are more likely to develop asthma, who are struggling far more under the weight of the pandemic, and who are least able to prepare for, recover from, and of course relocate to avoid, avoid heat waves, poor air quality, wildfires, flooding, and other impacts. To help right these generational wrongs, Administrator Regan has directed our senior leadership team and the entire EPA workforce to embed environmental justice into every aspect of our work, from our regulatory work to permitting to enforcement activity to the research we do and fund to grant making and even to wh with whom we do business. So that is just what we are doing at EPA. As you know, each time, as you may know, each time there's a new administration every four years, the agency develops a new four-year strategic plan. This year, for the first time ever, EPA's strategic plan includes a standalone agency goal on environmental justice and equity, setting the expectation the agency will take decisive action to advance environmental justice and civil rights. We will do this in our own programs, we will do it working with our external partners, and we will do it with our enforcement authority. This year was also historic because as a part of the process of developing that strategic plan, we added a fourth principle to the three principles that have guided EPA ever since William Ruckelshaus was administrator. You may remember um, that he famously said that if EPA follows the science, follows the law, and is transparent, it will do the job that it is expected to do. As of this year, EPA now has an additional, I'm starting to call them oak trees, oak trees of principle that we have added that we will advance justice and equity. And it's certainly our hope that that oak tree, that little oak tree sapling grows as tall and as strong as the other three. It was more than time to make this re fundamental responsibility of our agency explicit in our principles. We're also well aware that the impacts of climate change are becoming more and more real and dangerous in the US and across the globe. And the burden we feel from the climate crisis and other environmental stressors is not equally distributed. So there is overlap between um, our climate change imperative and our environmental justice imperative. And in that strategic plan, again, for the first time ever, we have a standalone goal focused on climate change. Black and African American individuals are projected to face higher impacts of climate change. They're more likely to live in neighborhoods with few trees and more heat trapping pavement. The rate of heat related deaths of black and African Americans is 150 to 200 percent greater than for non Hispanic whites. Native and indigenous individuals are 43% more likely to currently live in areas with the highest projected reductions in the labor hours due to extreme temperatures. There's a lot of words in that sentence. I apologize for that. But the, um, the, the point is clear that these impacts are um, uh, unequitable, inequitable, and unfair. American Indian and Alaska Native individuals 
are 48% more likely to currently live in areas where the highest percentage of land is projected to be inundated due to sea level rise. As you know, better than many, the climate crisis is worsening. Extreme weather has increased in frequency and ferocity, destroying homes, schools, and businesses, and cost America more than 100 billion last year alone. In New England, we're seeing changes in heavy rainfall frequency and intensity, and it's expected that sea level rise will be greater in the Northeast than the global average. Across the Midwest, where I live when I'm not in Washington, Historic floods, windstorms, and droughts have devastated farming communities and drenched neighborhoods, businesses, and manufacturing with significant risk and cost to public health and economic well-being. I've stood with mayors in Indiana who look over their shoulder at the Wabash River coming down to them in flood stage with nothing that they can do to stop it. And they've asked, what do we do? How do we protect the people of our communities? In Alaska, I mentioned um, uh, the percentage of land there subject to inundation, whole villages are being declared lost to climate change, unsavable, as barrier islands erode due to the absence of protective sea ice, and as permafrost, which for generations has provided natural refrigeration for native communities, as permafrost melts, tragically releasing even more greenhouse gases in the process. I've seen this with my own eyes. I actually saw it um, years ago, almost 10 years ago in 2012 when I, when I visited um, Alaska. And I saw um, villages, houses falling into the sea because they no longer had the protection of the sea ice. There's no small town, big city, or rural community across the country or throughout the world that is unaffected by climate change. It is truly global a societal massive challenge that crosses political, geographical, and cultural boundaries. It amplifies other challenges such as poverty, hunger, and global health, political instability, and the movement of people across physical and political boundaries, just to name a few. It also exacerbates an already challenging air quality landscape. For example, every year, pollution from power plants causes 8,000 fine particle and ozone-related premature deaths, tens of thousands of new asthma cases, thousands of heart attacks, and millions of lost school and work days. And I bet some of those statistics came from an HEI study. I'm just, I'm just betting. The adverse health impacts alone from power plant-related air pollution are valued at $80 billion per year, and that's before we consider the costs of climate change. And we know that health impacts and outcomes are worse for overburdened and underserved communities. More than 2,600 fossil fuel fired plants, that's 73% of the nation's generation capacity, fossil fuel fired generation capacity, are in communities of color or low income communities. We know that these communities often feel the direct impacts of this pollution and are rightly concerned about the effects these facilities have on their health and well-being. We can't avoid looking at these changes and these inequities, and we can and must address them. So we are at EPA are using every tool in the toolbox. First, we're taking aggressive action within our authorities to address the climate crisis. I assume that some of you are watching SCOTUS um, to see whether uh, the West Virginia decision is going to come out. Um, this morning, it may. Um, if anybody sees it, would you like leap up um, and, and let us all know? Um, so, so we are we are focused on this. Um, it's an important message to send to Americans that we are working on it, and it is one that the president reinforces um, and uh, and urges us ever onward. And we re reinforce it every day at EPA. Um, and, uh, and, and so do our colleagues at other federal agencies. Um, that comes back to the president's whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis. Every federal agency is working in sync to infuse climate change and racial equity into all aspects of our work. And it is um, uh, just a, 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 an honor and a joy for me in this role 
to be able to spend more time with my peers at the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, the Department of the Interior, Health and Human Services, all the agencies across the, the government, and to uh, work with them on the things that they are doing and to see how committed everyone is across the government uh, to, these, to these two imperatives. It's really un unprecedented and it's absolutely necessary. So um, we have an ambitious regulatory program, as you may know. Uh, we're taking aggressive action to get EPA's clean cars program back on track, to phase down the super pollutants, hydrofluorocarbons, and to, to deliver a strong rule to reduce methane pollution from the oil and gas sector. As they are finalized, these rules will have a significant impact. Our proposed methane rule is expected to reduce 41 million tons of methane emissions through 2035. That's more than the amount of CO2 emitted from all U.S. passenger cars and commercial aircraft in 2019. We're implementing the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, the AIM Act, uh, one of the most impactful pieces of legislation to happen uh, in recent years. That's expected to reduce more than 4.5 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent by 2050. Um, that's equal to nearly three years of U.S. power sector emissions um, looking at 2019 levels. And it will phase down production and consumption of HFCs by 85% over the next 15 years, with cumulative benefits totaling more than $272 billion um, through um, 2050. Um, this, this is just, the impact is just huge, and one of the great things about this program that, that I've known about for years, and, and you all have too, is how beneficial this is, not just to global health, um, but to the American economy, where we have companies that are on the lead, leading edge of developing alternative chemicals and alternative ways to achieve the things that we need to achieve refrigeration in countries that are getting hotter and hotter and hotter um, and are not going to do without it, but let's do it in a way that doesn't um, make the climate crisis even worse. And we're really proud of our proposed light duty vehicle emission standards, the, the strongest in history. Was that uh, a chime that the Supreme Court has delivered an opinion? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, uh, so that, that proposal would result in over 3 billion tons of avoided CO2 emissions through 2050. Um, also, um, as we know, there's um, an ever more important, it would save drivers billions of dollars in fuel costs through, through 2050. Um, we are taking action also to, uh, to address air quality issues that are exacerbate or are exacerbated by the climate crisis and that are EPA's basic responsibilities under the Clean Air Act, rules like the cross-state air pollution rule, the mercury and air toxic standard, and Administrator Regan's clean trucks plan uh, to look at reducing emissions uh, of a range of air pollutants, but especially NOx and greenhouse gases from heavy duty trucks and buses. Um, the MATS rule, um, one that I worked on um, during the Obama administration, um, delivers up to $90 billion of ben benefits each year, prevents 11,000 premature deaths, um, and it sets limits on uh, harmful toxic pollution, including mercury. Um, it requires every single power plant in the country to take action, and indeed they have done so, which um, means that the most vulnerable among us are protected from those levels of mercury as well as particulate matter and other emissions. Um, and the next generation of Americans will not have to suffer from um, uh, ingesting and uh, inhaling that toxic pollution. The Clean Trucks Plan sets stronger NOx standards um, and tightens greenhouse gas standards. Um, it sets strong standards for medium duty commercial vehicles. Um, these will, um, I just love these rules because of the immediate impact, on the ground impact that they have in our communities across the country. They save lives, uh, they improve quality of life. We're also focused on climate change mitigation in the non-regulatory work we do, and I want to mention in particular the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is um, a once in more than a generation opportunity to make sure 
that as we build the nation's infrastructure, we do it a, as a, in a way that does not further contribute to climate change and creates resilient communities along the way. And just to think about how momentous this is, um, I don't know how many of you were alive during the Eisenhower administration. Um, I wasn't, and I'm old. Um, this is the most significant investment in the country's infrastructure since the Eisenhower administration built out the federal highway system, the interstate highway system. So think about that. You know that um, this is this is right up there, um, and um, we have to make the most of this. EPA. Um, through the bipartisan infrastructure bill has um, $60 billion over um, the next five years. Uh, $50 billion of that will go to repair our um, aging drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. Um, what could be more important than that as we look at providing clean drinking water, um, um, uh, managing stormwater and wastewater at a time when, um, when flooding is increasing um, and those, um, those systems are expected to handle even more um, every day. Um, and so we're working hard to make sure that as we work with um, our state partners that those um, funds are invested in ways that will maximize resilient construction, uh, will do so in a way that does not increase emissions of greenhouse gas um, um, emissions um, uh, uh, during construction and after construction. The infrastructure bill includes more than $5 billion for cleaning up longstanding pollution in communities at Superfund sites. Um, more than one in four, that's a quarter of black and Hispanic Americans live within three miles of a Superfund site. Three miles of a Superfund site. Um, this money allows so many of those sites that are ready to go they have, the plans are done, they're ready to go, they were just waiting for the money. The money is now here, and those will be going forward. Um, one that I know you guys um, uh, will love is the $5 billion over five years to decarbonize the nation's school bus fleet. Nothing is more iconic than that yellow school bus taking American children to school all over the country. Nothing is more awful than the diesel pollution coming out of those tailpipes um, and following those kids around as they ride to and from school. Um, this is, is hugely significant funding to um, convert that fleet to electric buses. Um, and this is so exciting. People are so exciting, excited about it. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll just do a little um, commercial for you guys. We have our first chunk of money out, um, $500 million in a rebate program, and we want to have applications from every single state in the country um, from school districts wanting to replace diesel buses with electric buses. So wherever you're from, please go back. I'm sure you have a connection to somebody who goes to school or teaches in a school um, or is on a PTA, um, and make sure they know uh, to go check out the EPA um, Clean School Bus Rebate Program. So um, uh, I, I want to um, finish up so that, uh, that hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, I know that you've got three days worth of awesome um, things to talk about. Um, I, w I wish I could stay. I know I would learn so many things if I did, um, but please know that even if I'm not here, I totally get how important the work is that you're doing and how excited you are about it and how important gatherings are like this um, for you guys to learn from one another, to, um, uh, to be in community with one another. Um, there, when you come right down to it, there are only a certain number of people in the world that do the work that you do. And um, to be part of that group is an honor and a privilege, and I know you realize that, um, and take advantage uh, of this time together. Um, we also, I wanna ask you um, and urge you um, to stay engaged with us. Um, we are a policy-making agency that depends on science, on research, on facts, um, and um, uh, that's probably mine. Um, and on, um, uh, I'm gonna finish up here, on building that record. <laughs> so um, thank you for everything that you are doing and will do on that. Um, I'm gonna go turn off my phone and then we'll take some questions.
Thanks. While we work on the phone, I will say you may have caught a break for today. Yeah, the Supreme Court announcement did come out, but it's about prayers on the 50-yard line. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're, you're cool. So, we, so, that, we, so we, far, that's today, have, today's decision. 48 hours more of uh, pins and needles. Of pins and needles. Yeah. Right. So we are open the floor to questions after that remarkable um, uh, talk um, from Janet that uh, belied my opening comments about her compassion and caring for the human beings who are affected by the work of EPA. Um, uh, please come up to the, uh, to the microphone with any questions that you might have. And I, while people are doing that, I might start with one. Sure. And you really identified the importance of, of, of environmental justice and, and uh, disproportionate impacts on low-income populations throughout your talk. One of the challenges is that, um, and, and this may be a question to that uh, point, is that a lot of these impacts come from facilities that are in compliance. And it creates a challenge for EPA in terms of how to move forward um, with implementing uh, the Clean Air Act to deal with issues um, uh, of this nature. And it goes to the question of how's the agency thinking about cumulative impacts and how can we be helpful? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and, it, and it's so true. We're just learning more and more. And we're also learning how we're dealing with kind of micro environments, which is a, a, a shift for many of us that have worked in the air quality field for a long time where we looked at um, regional scale pollution, but we know that, um, that there are micro environments. So um, there are many things over which EPA does not have control, um, nor should we. We don't have control over local zoning decisions um, and land use decisions and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we do have responsibility for making sure that um, sources are in compliance. Um, we have responsibility for making sure that we run um, appropriate and transparent processes when permits are being issued or renewed um, and working with our state partners to make sure that they do that too. Um, the federal government has with responsibilities with respect to our civil rights laws in this country and we have a, a, a renewed focus and emphasis on our, through our Office of External Civil Rights um, to make sure that, um, that when there are um, demonstrated um, violations of those civil rights laws that, um, that uh, steps are taken to address those. Um, I think there's also um, increased um, attention to these issues at all levels of government. And um, we feel that one of the things that we can and should do is to shed light on situations and, and bring partners together who may have authorities beyond ours. Um, state government, local government, um, and uh, private sector um, to address uh, demonstrable inequities that uh, may not be subject to an EPA law or regulation, but nevertheless, somebody should be paying attention to. You did capture my first question. <clears throat> Second question is, the definition of equity is problematic in the context that we have environmental advocacy groups that are well versed in uh, policies and practices and their voices are essential and need to be a part of the conversation but they do so in many metropolitan areas by dismissing the concerns the issues and the reflections of the neighborhoods and those overburdened and under benefited communities yet because of their understanding of the processes those seem to be the voices that EPA listens to. Is there going to be a statement or actions forthcoming that acknowledge the role and responsibilities of those advocacy, those environmental advocacy groups, and aggressively, aggressively seeks the voices that those groups don't represent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I, I, I think that Administrator Regan. Um, has demonstrated that he understands that. Um, and um, uh, you may know that um, uh, uh, several months ago, um, he, well, he, he visits communities on a regular basis. Um, he sits on people's porches, he talks to them, um, uh, and he completely understands the dynamic that, that you are talking about. Um, in our, um, uh, our, our, our outreach, our technical assistance um, through the bipartisan infrastructure law and spilling over into all grant making that we do, um, there is um, an, an increased emphasis on bringing communities to the table who have not had the ability to get there before. Um, building capacity 
in the, the not the usual partners in terms of environmental advocacy. So um, I, I hope uh, people are seeing that, that this administrator um, understands the importance of um, lifting up and providing a place at the table um, for the community groups, the people who live in neighborhoods um, and have been actually suffer the pollution that um, is being emitted um, or exists in their communities. Great. Right. Other questions? Eloise Murray, UCL. It's just a brief question on how all of these um, ideas and plans for clean air can become impervious to changes in administration. That's, uh, that is the question of the hour, right? That's the question of the hour. Um, uh, I don't know that anybody has an answer to that. Um, uh, we, we live in the system that we live, and administrations are, are always in a position to, um, to change policy. Um, certainly our, our goal is to um, embed and ingrain as much of um, our, our, our expectation and our understanding of how the Clean Air Act and other laws um, uh, are to be implemented um, as much as we can, um, and we'll keep doing that. And, and I just, just say, I guess, you know, not to throw this back onto you guys, um, but, but the, the science and facts and data um, are not as subject to the changes of a political system. Um, so the more of that that is generated and is, is publicized so that people understand it, um, the harder it will be for future administrations to do things that are uh, contrary to it. Hi, Mike Chair from UCLA. Thanks for the interesting and informative talk. Um, just following up on that point you just made, I mean, we need research funding to do the research that informs you know, sci you know, the science that's going to inform your policy, and due to the disastrous policies of the last administration, I mean, the EPA STAR program was basically gutted, as, and there, there hasn't really been a major funding announcement from your agency since the new administration's been elected. I understand there was a lot of money in the Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. It was going to improve the, the right. research infrastructure, but right, right now it's a very, um, you know, underfunded area from everything from wildfires to right. heat, stress, anything that has to do with climate, you put an application in and you're lucky if you get like 3% of it funded. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered what the EPA's future plans are for funding climate change research and um, whether or not there's going to be any expansion in those areas because we really need it. If you want the science to inform your policy, we need it. Oh, yeah, for, for, for sure. Um, and uh, funding from, uh, from agencies like EPA is absolutely essential. Um, uh, it is certainly the goal of the agency to increase um, uh, funding in, the, in those areas. Um, and uh, we work with the administration. The president put, puts forward a budget. Um, his um, uh, proposed budget for FY23 is really ambitious. Um, and that goes the, through the congressional process. So, um, so we're in there swinging for, for, for funding in those areas. Appreciate your efforts. Good yeah. luck. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I am Melissa Perry from George Washington University. So delighted that you were able to have time to be here. Really lucky that you decided to step back into the EPA for a second try, a second shot. Um, my question I think you're going to like because it taps into your prior identity just um, previous to coming back to the administration and that's uh, as an academic. And so I'm sure you can attest to how important it is to invest in people power and capabilities and the best trained, talented uh, folks that can lead these directives. Um, getting back to the question about making sure that the um, movement toward um, uh, fighting environmental justice is impervious to political uh, maneuvers, mach machinations. You want to make sure that the next generation really understands how important this is. Yep. So with that, what would you advise as we look toward training the next generation at universities? Um, HEI invests in cultivating junior investigators, so we have to really do that and do it mm -hmm. well and mm -hmm. at the same time folks that can translate science and policy. So where you yeah. are, um, yeah. and given your academic background, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm just sort of a, um, uh, I don't really consider myself an academic, um, uh, 
although I got to hang out with them for, for four years. Um, and I, and I, I really did uh, get an increased appreciation for the importance of, of universities um, in, doing, in doing these very things. So, you know, I think there are so many eager, young, smart people out there going through these programs. Um, we need to um, make sure that they have opportunities. Um, uh, I know your organization would support that. Um, and EPA needs to do that too. One of the um, things I think we need to focus on is making sure that, that um, all American, smart American young people have the opportunity to, to go through these um, uh, undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, there is not sufficient diversity um, in those fields, I would say, at this point to, um, to, to deliver a truly diverse representative um, a group of, of qualified researchers um, who uh, will bring the diversity of the whole country um, to the work that we do and, as you say, to the translation of science um, into policy and into, um, into public education. So um, uh, we're, we're hiring, EPA is, hi EPA is hiring, just saying, um, uh, the infrastructure bill gives us an incredible opportunity to bring young people into the agency and um, just as a, a commercial, um, if, if you come into EPA as a grants officer, um, uh, because that's the, where we have so much money to, to provide to people through grants, that may not sound very exciting if you're a biologist or, or whatever you are. It, it's an amazing way to get into the agency. You're working directly with communities um, to help them achieve the goals that they want in their communities. And once you get into EPA, the ability to, to move around and experience other uh, ways of serving are just uh, immense. So um, I think partnerships um, with, uh, with universities and Administrator Regan, there could be no better ambassador to minority serving institutions of higher education um, that are, than our own administrator who graduated from a historically black college, um, uh, which I just think is just um, a, an amazing thing to be, to be able to say. Um, so let's, let's pay attention to those young people and get them into interesting jobs. Thanks a million. Yeah. I should probably do these two and then yeah. hop right. off because I'm time. way late for whatever it is this next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Hi, my name is Barbara Hoffman, University of Düsseldorf in Germany and ATI Research Committee. Um, thanks so much for your talk and the focus on environmental inequity. And um, so that, of course, has a global um, perspective as well. And I was yeah. wondering, what is EPA doing to prevent shifting adverse health effects to other parts of the world while it's restructuring its own um, economy, country, and society? Right, so um, one of the things we do is partner with groups like HEI um, that, uh, that work very directly around the world. Um, one other little example of just so you know we're thinking about this um, is in our school bus program um, and in our diesel retrofit program, um, there's a requirement that, um, that the, uh, uh, any new bus replace an old bus um, and that that old bus has to actually be, be dismantled. Um, and the key reason for that is that we don't want that old bus being sent to some other community in the U.S. or um, another country um, to, to take that pollution along with them. We're also very involved um, through our, our Office of International and Tribal Affairs and through our, our program offices in international efforts um, and, and bring those issues and, and sensibilities to, um, to the work that we do domestically. Okay, thanks. Thank you for staying for our questions and for taking time to, to come visit with us. It means a lot. Um, my question follows up on what Melissa was saying about young people. And I actually looked up the title of this program that used to exist, the Greater Research Opportunity, or GROs for Undergraduate Fellowships, and the Science to Achieve Results, or STAR Fellowships for Graduate Students. Um, I got a STAR Fellowship for my PhD school, and I am 100% confident that without it, I would not be here today, because I would not have been uh, had the ability to study the types of things I wanted to study. My understanding from talking to folks at EPA is not only have these programs been gone for several years, but they're not even conversations about bringing them back. So I, I hear what you're saying about the commitment to young people, yeah. but without getting you know, support to get them through graduate school, it will yeah. not happen. And, and other programs like NSF and NIH yeah. do not fund the type of innovative projects that I know many of the EPA STAR fellowships did. So my question is, um, 
are there, are there any conversations about bringing back these types of programs or similar ones? Because I think there's nothing else like them. Thank yeah. you. Well, I know that my colleagues in the Office of Research and Development um, uh, think about this all the time um, and are always looking for opportunities to bring people in. We are looking at, this isn't exactly what, what you're referring to, but we are looking at our internship program programs across the agency um, because I would say they are sort of, um, uh, they're, they're disconnected. Um, we do not have a comprehensive way of looking at um, bringing um, students um, at whatever level into the agency. And uh, so that's a, that's a priority of this, uh, this EPA is to um, bring some more order um, and certainty and, um, and funding to those kinds of opportunities. So, um, so we will we'll continue um, to, to look at those things. And uh, if, it's, if it's not exactly the kind of program or the, the name of the program that we had before, um, hopefully we will be able to um, increasingly have opportunities for, for young people to, to get funding to come to EPA. All right. All right. Thank you all so much. And uh, thank you, Thank you all for your questions, and Janet, for taking your time. Uh, we have to send you back to work, given the list of, uh, of jobs that you have ahead of you. Yes, so, for so sure. Thanks for coming. Bye, everybody. We'll move on to the next session, so please stay seated, since we already had our break. Thanks.